Hi church family and happy Sabbath. We are so grateful to have you worshiping with us today from wherever you are on whatever device you may be streaming on. It is so fantastic to have you with us. And can I just say, one of my favorite parts as we've been practicing this time as a church without walls is just how much you have been interacting with us. Whether it's on the Facebook live stream while the church service is going on, saying hi and happy Sabbath to the rest of us. Those of you who've been emailing us to let us know what's going on in your lives. And for those of you who have said yes to being a part of our church service and our worship together each week, thanks for those virtual choirs. Thanks so much to all of you who have done a scripture reading or for those of you who have said yes uh, to playing a special music. This, friends, is so special that we continue to be a church like this. And we just thank you for joining us and continuing to make this feel like home from our own homes. So as we prepare for the worship service today, I just encourage you uh, to give thanks to God and to invite the Holy Spirit into our presence at this time. Happy Sabbath.
I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. For your mercy reaches unto the heavens, and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. Good morning, church family, and welcome to Church Life. We miss you, and we're grateful for technology that keeps us communicating and connected, but it's not like being in each other's presence. We miss seeing you, hearing your laugh, praying with you in person, and even worshiping God together in each other's presence. We look forward to that day. We have a few announcements before we continue. First, we're really excited to announce a new seminar series called Covered. Dr. Augusta Olari will be leading us in a discussion about how we can develop personal coping strategies in the midst of crisis. She's been educating families and individuals for many years in this area, and she's helped people thrive even during times that are challenging or times of crisis. To register for this seminar, go to our website at graceunconditional.com. Go to the ministry section, click it, a drop-down menu will appear, click covered and it will take you to a page where you click a register button that will lead you to zoom account 
We hope that you'll let your friends and family know about this, and we hope that you'll join us tomorrow at 3 p.m. for this seminar. We also have the SOS Coronavirus Challenge, where we're inviting every family to bring canned goods and dry beans to the SOS thrift shop located across the street from the Vallejo Drive Church. We're taking these items in on May 6th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. We're also looking for volunteers to help us this Wednesday sort, package, and deliver these items, of course, with the safety precautions and guidelines in place. We'd love to have you serve with us. And if you have any questions about serving, we invite you to contact Pastor Linda. Also on our website, we have the coronavirus page where we have information that gives resources and other important information that could help you or your family or someone you know. So let them know about this page after checking it out on our website. And we have the mainline prayer ministry that meets every Wednesday at 12 p.m. We call a number, key in the ID, press pound, and we gather together to hear a short devotional by one of our pastors. We give praises to God as encouragement to one another, and we take prayer requests to lift each other up. This is a great time to meet in the middle of the week with your church family or anyone you know that might have a need they want to express and share through prayer. Church family, thank you for joining us today in our worship service. As we continue to praise and worship God today and listen to our message from Pastor Kyle, we pray that you will be blessed and that you'll share that blessing with others this week. Hi, church family. Thank you for your great generosity. As most of you know, I'm Ash, but I'm so excited to update you on the ways you have partnered with Read and Feed Blees to create a positive impact on the world of children. Through your support and sharing the love of Christ, so many amazing things has happened. Allow me to show you. We have been about our Father's business. You have helped by making outreach programs possible. We fed the hungry, created learning activities, and reading materials were donated from our own SOS thrift store. Thanks, Diane. And we did all of this while sharing the love of Christ in a safe Christian environment. I hope you all have a happy Sabbath, and I'm looking forward to sending more updates and seeing you soon. Thank you, Vallejo! Let me tell you a story about a king and three brave men, all with really strange names. I am the king. My name is Nebuchadnezzar. My name is Shadrach. I'm Meshach. And I'm Abednego. 
we all lived in a place called Babylon. The three men worked for me. They had important jobs for the province of Babylon. One day, the king decided to build a huge image made of gold. It stood 90 feet tall. Imagine 15 men standing one on top of the other. That's how big it was. King Nebuchadnezzar then made an announcement. People of all countries, when you hear this music, you must bow down and worship the statue because I have said so. Whoever does not obey and worship the statue will immediately be thrown into a fiery furnace. The problem with this is that God doesn't want us to worship anything or anyone else than him. After all, he is God. He made us and he loves us so much. He cares about every little thing in our lives. Why would we want to pray or worship something that isn't real? Something that can't answer our prayers or help us. To worship a big pile of gold, like the one that King Nebuchadnezzar built, is just silly. That gold can't hear or see. It didn't care about anything or anyone. So the next time the music played, everyone stopped what they were doing and they bowed down to the idol. Everyone that is, except for Shadrach, Abednego, and me. Some of the king's workers saw that the three of us would not bow down to the image, so they immediately ran to tell the king. I think they were just jealous of our good jobs. When I heard the news, I was very angry. I immediately ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought to me to explain their actions. We were brought before the king. I said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you will not bow down and worship the image of gold that I have made? Perhaps there was a mistake. I will give you another chance. When the music beat plays again, you will be ready and bow down to the image. If you don't this time, you will be thrown into a fiery furnace. Then what God will be able to save you? Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we did not make a mistake, nor will we apologize for not bowing down to the image. If we are thrown into the furnace, the God we worship will save us. He will rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know that we will not serve your gods, nor will we serve any gold statues you have set up. Now I'm even more angry. Increase the heat in the furnace as hot as it will go. I want the strongest soldiers in my army to take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the furnace and throw them into the fire. The soldiers grabbed us and dragged us to the furnace. We were still wearing all our clothes, including robes, shirts, and pants underneath. We had turbans on our heads. All these things would catch fire very easily in the furnace. As the soldiers pushed us into the furnace, the flames were so hot it killed the soldiers. We don't We tumbled into the hot, hot furnace. I jumped to my feet in amazement and asked my advisors, weren't there only three men thrown into the fire? They replied, oh, yes, king. I said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, untied and unhurt, and the fourth looks like some kind of angel. I went as close as I could to the furnace and shouted in the doorway, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, followers of the Most High God, come out. Come here. We walked out of the furnace without any burns. Not a hair on our heads were singed. Our clothes were perfectly fine. They didn't even smell like smoke. At that moment, I knew that these men worshipped a real God, not some fake statue. God had sent an angel to protect them from harm. I realized that they truly believed and trusted in God. They were willing to die rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. From that 
day on, I made an announcement that all the people, people of all countries, could not say anything bad about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God, or they would be badly punished. He gave us even better jobs than we'd had before in the province of Babylon. Hi, Valeo Drive. Happy Sabbath. I am coming at you from our living room. The dogs are just out on the patio enjoying the sun, and I am very happy to open up our offering portion for today. I have been so blessed by watching our team work so hard and so diligently, so many long hours and late nights throughout the weeks just to be able to produce the content that we've been producing and troubleshooting and creatively coming up with new and more efficient ways to put all of this out there so that we can have virtual community, that we can still have ministries, that we can still do outreach and we still have you know ministries reaching all sorts of demographics. And our team has just been so good to each other. It hasn't been easy the whole way. And just the fact that we're, you know, we're coming through it with uh, smiles, we're coming through it with sweat, we're coming through it uh, just with everything that we've got. And we just really are so grateful for everyone that has contributed. And I just want to bring um, a scriptural thought about contribution from Second Corinthians and just how the contribution really is between you and God. Uh, it's something that God puts on your heart. It's something that comes out of spending time with him, something that is a, a product of your uh, of your personal time with him, something that he that he he presses on you. And I and it's not from anywhere else. It's from it's from God. And just the fact that we've had so many people feel such a conviction to give during this time, whether it's through their time or their talents or um, their means, um, so that we're able to put on uh, everything that we've been putting on. It has just been awesome to experience, and I'm so grateful to be part of such a, a passionate family that just wants to make community happen no matter what happens, no matter what we're faced with. And it just really shows that this community is strong despite what um, will be put on its plate. And if it's cool with you, I would love to pray, have some prayer time with you right now. 
Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for each individual that is participating, uh, that is interacting and contributing to uh, our community. God, thank you so much for each way that we are able to uniquely give uh, because of our time and because of our, our convictions and love that we have received from spending time with you. God, I just pray that um, everyone gets that own, makes time for their own personal uh, space where they get to just really experience the blessings that you've given them. And from that, they feel convicted to give however uh, you have put it on their hearts to do so. God, thank you so much for this time together. And I just pray a special blessing on the rest of the worship service. God bless our leaders and the pastor. God, I just want you to be um, with the message that you've put on his heart with all the time that you've spent with him. God, be with him as he delivers this message to the community and be on our hearts and our ears as we listen. Amen. Good morning. Berlin and I send our greetings. We are doing well, and we hope you are too. Well, in times like these, prayer is important. We want you to know that we and all the pastoral staff have been praying for you. So join me now as we bow our heads for prayer. Gracious Lord, as we worship today each in our own home, we honor you as our Savior and Lord who watches over and sustains us. We thank you for your many blessings to us in this dramatically difficult time. As the Prince of Peace, we ask that you gift us with calmness. Help us to be wise and prudent in all we do. Keep us safe and heal those afflicted with disease. Protect all those on the front line as they serve others. Give guidance to all our political, social, and spiritual leaders. We also entrust you with our other desires for our financial needs, our jobs, our family and friends, and for our personal requests. May this worship time renew our hearts and minds. Bless us today through the words of Pastor Kyle. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.
Good morning, my friends. Let us pray. Lord, as we now open your word, speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How do we respond when our core beliefs are met with skepticism, ridicule, and accusations of fanaticism? One of the reasons so many young people and young adults turn away from the message is that in secular circles, a Christian's ethics and values appear ridiculous. And this is especially true when we talk about end time events. So how do we respond when our core beliefs meet only disbelief and scorn? When our soundness of mind is questioned because we hold certain beliefs sacred? Face it, we certainly appear peculiar to many. For instance, we hold our bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we don't use alcohol, tobacco, or recreational drugs. We believe the earth was created in six literal days. Therefore, we reject the notion of spontaneous generation. We believe in the seventh day Sabbath, which places us at odds with the rest of Christianity. We hold that the dead rest in their graves until the resurrection. The Christian world says, they're already in heaven. And we look forward to the literal return of Jesus in a cataclysmic fashion, preposterous the world's think to the world's thinking. And although we have solid biblical evidence for each of these preceding doctrinal truths, the delusion in our society is so deep that propositional truth can't break through the fog. We can't convince non-believers of the clarity of our logic and persuasive arguments the most powerful argument for truth is a committed life. So let me pause and just tell you a story. The story is told about some soldiers in a country far away who went into a church one morning while the services were being held and they announced to the whole audience that anybody who's not ready to die for their faith should walk out of the church. Well, you can well imagine seeing armed soldiers, a bunch of people walked out of the church. And then they said to those people, good, now we have real Christians. They put down their weapons and sat through the rest of the church service. Some people are not ready to actually live their faith. So we turn in the Bible to the story of three Hebrew boys. In Daniel 3, the familiar story is told of these three Hebrew captives in the land of Babylon. Daniel had interpreted a dream for the king Nebuchadnezzar, who had had an image. In that, in that image, there was a head of gold, arms of chest of silver, a stomach of bronze, legs and thighs of iron and feet of iron and clay. The golden head represented Babylon. The king took exception to the notion that his kingdom would come to an end. So he erected a 100 foot image, all of gold. He called for all of his noblemen to assemble on the plain of Dura. When the music played, all were to bow down and worship the image. You know how the rest of the story ends. The three Hebrew boys declined that order. When the king heard about their refusal, he was upset. The young men were brought before him to answer for their refusal and were offered one more chance to get it right. After threatening the young men, the king asked a very important question. And who is this God who will deliver you from my hands? Daniel 3.15. The king wanted to be worshipped as God. Therefore, he obviously saw himself as some form of God. So let me paraphrase their answer. Yo, dude, we ain't afraid of you. Our God can deliver us from your barbecue. And even if he doesn't, we still not going to bow. By the way, no animals were harmed during the production of this paraphrase. Conviction. By definition, a firmly held belief or opinion, the quality of showing that one is firmly convinced of what one believes or says. If there is ever a time for something to be missing in our society right now, it is conviction, the ability to show that we are firmly convinced of what we believe. It's not that we would ever declare that we don't believe God. We just pick and choose what portions of his word we will take seriously and which ones we will leave aside. So we have vegetarian fornicators, Sabbath school attending drunkards, choir singing hell raisers, Bible toting bigots. Our lack of conviction is so apparent that no one really takes us seriously. 
While we sell Mercedes, we drive Chevys. Our goal looks like copper. Our praise is interrupted by the discordant sounds of gossip. Our adherence to our message is predicated on convenience, not conviction. What the world is looking for is the real thing, an authentic, courageous Christian witness, someone who lives like they know Jesus personally. It's encore time. History is about to repeat itself. In this story, we find three young men who were so deeply convicted of the truth that they were willing to die for what they believed. Martin Luther King Jr. said, if a man hasn't found something he's willing to die for, he isn't fit to live. But we are, we are reminded that the same challenge that faced these three young men in Babylon will face true believers as we near the end of time. It's the challenge of fidelity. Who are we going to serve? What are we prepared to die for? The time has come when even believers are doubting that this country could ever be a place where religious liberty would be selectively withdrawn, that personal freedoms could be taken away. But in the book of Revelation, John is given a vision of the last days and the rise of a political religious power that will constrain the world to carry out false worship. In Revelation chapter 13, the United States is pictured as a lamb-like beast that will create an image to this political religious power. So we pick up the story in verse 15. And it says, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, some of you may be wishing that this passage was omitted from scripture. It's troubling to think about this, and it's even worse to try to tell it to others. They would label you a fool if you believe it. But let me read you a quote from a book called Maranatha, The Lord is Coming. It says, history will be repeated. False religions will be exalted. The first day of the week, a common working day, possessing no sanctity whatever, will be set up as was the image in Babylon. All nations and tongues and peoples will be commanded to worship the spurious Sabbath. This is Satan's plan to make of no account the day instituted by God and given to, his, to the world as a memorial of creation. So the final issue will be centered not necessarily just on a day, but in our conviction to obey all the law of God. Let me continue reading from that passage. It says, the season of distress before God's people will call for a faith that will not falter. His children must make it manifest that he is the only object of their worship and that no consideration, not even that of life itself, can induce them to make at least the least concession to false worship. To the loyal heart, the commands of sinful, finite men will sink into insignificance beside the word of the eternal God. Truth will be obeyed, though the result may be imprisonment, exile, or even death. Because Sabbath keeping is enjoined on all believers in the fourth commandment, it has been under attack by Satan for centuries. The Sabbath is a memorial of creation. It is the only day upon which God rested, sanctified it, and made it holy. To substitute another day in its place is to raise our fists to heaven and tell God that we won't obey him. We will do this our way and not God's way. It is indeed rebellion. Now, the similarities between these two stories are striking. In one, we have the image of gold, in the other, the image of the beast. In one, a fiery furnace, and in the other, economic extortion, imprisonment, and death. I'm amazed at how many people think that this prophecy in Revelation 
or the story that even happened in Daniel 3. It's just too far out to believe. Do you think that the subjugation and persecution of religious minorities is somehow beneath us, beneath the United States? Well, why not ask African slaves if dehumanizing treatment of innocent people on the basis of their color is beneath us? Ask Native Americans if mass genocide to tame the West is somehow beneath us. Ask Japanese Americans stripped of their property and, and rights and held in camps because of their national heritage. Is, was that beneath us? Ask civil rights protesters brutalized on the William Pettus Bridge if it's beneath us. Ask Afri African Americans today who are subjected to voter suppression in many states. Is it beneath us? Stop by the lynching museum in Montgomery, Alabama and ask those people there, is barbarism beneath us? We are a country more willing to give up our freedoms to maintain our sense of safety. And we will all but strip search ourselves just to get on a plane. Revelation 13, 11 tells us that this lamb-like beast will speak like a dragon. Don't let the smooth taste fool you. Just stay alert and you will hear dragon speak. You know, a few years ago, I had a hip replaced. And when I go to the airport, the scanners have to go, if I can get through a scanner, I'm fine. But if not, I have to be patted down and, and groped by TSA agents just so I can get on a plane. I was talking to my oldest son one day and I asked him if I needed to worry about being stopped by police, as I used to be in my youth. He looked at me and said, Dad, you no longer fit the profile. You don't look dangerous. I was very disappointed to hear that. But don't tell me that our lamb-like country can't speak like a dragon. History would prove you wrong. And now COVID, a legitimate public health emergency, has half the world locked up in their homes, unable to congregate, attend church, or go to the mall. And to keep us all safe, we need to comply. I'm all right with that. But it illustrates that government does have the power to constrain personal freedoms when it's seen to be in the national interest. In the face of public unrest, acts of terror, global pestilence, we would gladly find ourselves someone to blame or either give up or take away someone's personal freedoms just to return to what we consider to be normal time. Without conviction, we can be blown about by the winds of societal pressures to conform to the national will. Without conviction, the peer pressure of, non, of the non-committed can draw us away from the express will of God. Without conviction, the atheistic television pundits and, com and comedians can embarrass us into keeping silent about our belief in a living God. The convicted will often sacrifice be persecuted, be fired from their jobs, have their so-called friends turn their backs on them. Conviction, you see, has its price. For the three Hebrew boys, to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's golden image was not an option. They wouldn't go along just to get along. They stood their ground because they were convicted that thou shalt have no other gods before me. Just as it was for Shadrach and his friends, our commitment and conviction to truth will be the most powerful testimony and witness to others. How you live, how you love, how you forgive has much more impact than what you know. Their willingness to walk into the fire demonstrated their sincerity of their conviction, the seriousness of their commitment, and ultimately the saving power of their God was demonstrated for all to see. So let me close. Perhaps the most serious threat to our conviction is not the fiery furnace, being socially ostracized or even ridiculed by others. Conviction can grow weak when our commitment is to a set of lifeless principles or concepts. You can't count on your adherence to propositions to hold you steadfast when the music of compromise starts to play. Conviction for the child of God is not to a set of laws or prophetic utterances. We must be convicted because of our love and faith in the person of Jesus Christ. That's where courage of our convictions begins and ends. 
I hold on to the conviction that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I am convicted because once I was lost, and now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. I am convicted because there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. The blood of Jesus has washed me of my sins. I'm convicted. His spirit fills my mind and my heart. I'm convicted. If any man be in Christ, he is indeed a new creature. It is my connection to a living God that creates my conviction. I know just what he has done for me, and therefore I know what he can do for you. The power of our testimony is the fuel of our conviction. I am convicted that Jesus is Lord, that he is coming back again because I've heard him speaking to me in my prayers and in my devotion. The more I know him, the more I'm convinced that he indeed is real. The simple idea of God will not foster conviction, but the resurrected Christ in your life is a sustaining power. The songwriter captured it perfectly when she wrote, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. So how about you? It's not about what you believe that keeps you in these difficult times. It's about who you believe in, who you trust, who you have come to know personally. Is Christ living in your heart? Do you really know him? Have you taken the time to experience the joy of salvation? Ask Jesus to make himself real in your life today. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. Isaiah 30, 15 says, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. But you would not. But you would not. Don't let that be your epitaph. In the quietness of your heart, you will find confidence that can only come from a living God. Seek him. Confess and submit your will to his loving grace and forgiveness. You want real conviction? Try Jesus. Lord and Father, as we close your word, I pray that those who have seen this program, who have experienced this message, will recognize the importance of submission and surrender. Give us the conviction, not that comes from just propositional truth, but comes from a living connection to our God. Help us to stand in these awful times. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless.
My friends, I pray that you've enjoyed this service today and that God has spoken to you about the conviction in your own heart. We serve a powerful God. Serve him, love him, let him make you joyful and committed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being with us today for every element of our service. We pray that you've been able to reach hearts today, that men and women will change their lives because they've changed their God and serve you, the only true God. Be with us is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye-bye.